everybody, and welcome to the third in our series on the beauty of the brain. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome you here. It's kind of slushy and awful out tonight, but this is a good thing to do is to exercise our own brains as we listen to these wonderful colleagues give their lectures. I'm going to ask you, as always, to make sure that your cell phones are off. I'm going to remind you that on the back of your program, you still have a chance for free admission to the exhibit about the brain over in the Skaggs building. Uh, Richard tells me he thinks it's going to be here until about, until about the middle of March. So you have a couple more weeks to get over there and look at that exhibit, too, if you would, if you would like to. And um, it should be a good supplement to this lecture series, I think. I also want to remind you that MCAT is filming all of these lectures. Uh, lectures as virtually every year we've had done. And a little later on in the series, I think we'll be able to give you the schedule for when they're going to be shown on MCAT. So if you want to recommend them to any friends who haven't been able to attend, or if you want to um, revisit one of the lectures or all of the lectures and just have good memories of sitting in a room with lots of smart people who are eager to learn, learn more, um, tune in to MCAT and you'll be able to watch the series. I'm really, really pleased tonight to be able to introduce our lecturer, uh, Dr. Sarah Sertel. Um, she's actually been with us only for only since last year, I believe. Um, and President uh, Engstrom and I were saying that's really nice. Bring her to campus and say immediately, here, give a give a lecture, right? Uh, but she has such a reputation, I think, with her colleagues that when it was intended that we would put together this series, I think her name came immediately to their minds. So I'm really glad that Sarah's here with us. Her um, PhD is from the University of Iowa. She then went to Harvard University, and she came to us after a research fellowship in Harvard University. She seems to have taught in some summer programs nationally and internationally, which sound to have been in wonderful places. And I'm sure that her students really benefited deeply and, and uh, broadly from her interest. This is actually, I want to say, the most beautiful fruit fly I've ever seen. <laughs> I didn't know they wore yellow and pink. I thought they were just sort of dark and funky looking. I went on, um, actually went online this, this week. I asked one of, some of my students in a big class this week, how do you make a decision? If you've got a really important decision, how do you make it? And somebody in the back said, Google it. So I thought, well, that was a little scary. But I tried Googling it. And the first entry I found for fruit flies started out with, fruit flies are nasty. Here's how you can get rid of them. Um, I have a suspicion that Sarah probably doesn't feel exactly the same way about the fruit fly. We're getting to a little bit more macro uh, level now when we're talking about things that we can actually see wandering around, though not in our kitchens, of course. Um, but in any case, Sarah, I'm really pleased to invite you here to speak to us tonight on the fruit fly. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I'm not used to wearing a lapel mic, so if you can't hear me, I'll switch to the other microphone, but we'll try. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the Alumni Association, Jay and everybody else, and Chris Comer for the opportunity to speak tonight. Chris is away tonight. He's in Washington, D.C., so I can tell you that when he called, he said, he asked me if I'd like to be on the Alumni Lecture Series Committee, and I said yes. And it wasn't until the first meeting that I realized that speaking was involved. <laughs> However, I'm very honored and happy to do so tonight, and I thank you all for coming. The title of my talk is Love and War, How the Fruit Fly Brain is Wired for Behavior, but mostly I'm going to talk about war tonight, and that is aggression. And I'm going to try to cover three aspects in the talk. First, I'm going to tell you, show you the beauty and the complexity of Drosophila behavior and give you a couple slides of history of why we use flies. Secondly, I'm going to show you some beautiful individual pictures of neurons in the fly brain, and then some really neat genetic tools that we use to both visualize and manipulate, manipulate neuron function. And finally, I'm going to try to incorporate into every aspect of the talk <laughs> why, besides myself, anybody will care about what we're doing in flies and the applications we foresee and how we're trying to uh, contribute to the neuroscience community. OK, to briefly review from last week, as Rich so eloquently described to us, 
Each neuron is a piece of cellular machinery that relies on neurochemical, the chemical synapse, um, signaling molecules in the, in the synapse between neurons, and electrophysiological mechanisms, how the current gets propagated or um, sent down through the neuron. To integrate complicated inputs and communicate information to other neurons. Yet, no matter how complex a single neuron is, and this green neuron is one individual neuron from the fly brain, a single neuron can never perceive beauty, feel sadness, or solve a math problem. These capabilities emerge only when networks or ensembles of neurons work together. And tonight I'm going to try to bridge the gap between Rich's seminar or talk about synaptic signaling and John's talk next week on human behavior and tell you how, why we're using flies to identify the players, how these players find each other, get wired up, and their behavior changes to orchestrate the beautiful music that is life. And so my talk is divided into three parts. First, the majority of the talk is going to be that behavior is hardwired. But then I have two shorter stories to throw you a curve that behavior is also plastic, and then how flies make the decisions of when to mate and when to fight. And through these three stories, I'm going to try to keep the lines of the beauty of the fly brain and applications throughout. All right. The first scientist to really pioneer the use of Drosophila was Thomas Hunt Morgan, shown here in his lab in Columbia. And among many other things, he said, to know your organism, you must eat it. And we inadvertently do so quite often in the lab. <laughs> but the great contribution he had to to genetic studies and to science was that he wanted to pursue an experimental as opposed to descriptive approach to biology. And up to this time, many people had described different species, plants, even the beautiful neurons that you've seen images of. But he wanted to know, how did it work? And we're happy to use flies to study the brain because flies have a much simpler nervous system. As a, flies have about 100,000 neurons, as opposed to the 80 to uh, 100 billion neurons in, in us. Flies have around 300 different types of neurons, so it's still quite a large number, but compared to our 10,000, it's much simpler. Flies have almost 14,000 genes, which is quite a lot, and we only have around 25,000 genes. But many of the fly genes that uh, many, almost a good portion of the fly genes have homologs. Either they look the same in humans or they function the same way in humans, with just a few exceptions. All right. So there's many, there's many people working on aggression in flies now. By many, I mean I think there's probably 30, but still, that's pretty many. <laughs> uh, but there's two important people that I want to start with. First is um, Alfred Sturdivant, who was a student of Thomas Hunt Morgan. And he first reported on Drosophila aggression in 1915, but it was buried in a paper on sexual recognition. And there was a few reports in the 50s and 60s, and these were mostly um, descriptive as well. And then Ari Hoffman in the 80s had a nice series of paper looking at um, how flies fight and the environmental conditions. But it really wasn't till to about 10 years ago, 2000, 2001, that my former boss and mentor, Ed Kravitz, decided to, look, to switch from using lobsters and crayfish, which he had been using for the past 30 or 40 years to study aggression because crustaceans really fight. He decided that at the age of 69 that he was going to quit, uh, try a different um, organism and switch to fruit flies because he realized that there was a lot of really um, cool genetics that you can do to answer what genes are involved in aggression. So um, he's done that. He's pictured here with my son. And um, so I'm going to try to be careful to tell you what work um, I have done in his lab, what work we're doing here in, in my lab, and then what work other people in his lab have done. All right, this slide may not be important, so important for our audience, but in Boston, people aren't 
quite in touch with nature as much, so they forget that aggression is an important evolved behavior. It really provides functions that are essential for species survival. Animals need it to defend their territory, defend their progeny, and have access to mates. Aggression is also a complex social behavior. It's really energy consuming for the participants. There's a certain amount of risk, depending on which species. There's a lot of communication going on between uh, animals that are fighting. So I'm going to show you a movie clip here of two male flies fighting. And like the previous slide, they're fighting over a territory, which is here, this cup. And the cup is filled with food. So they're, in, they're, all, they're fighting over territory. They're fighting over resource, food. And they're also fighting over access to this um, sadly headless female here in the middle. <laughs> and what you're going to see is that um, this male is going to do this lunge behavior. And it's when he re rears up on his hind legs and snaps down on the other fly. And he's going to do this over and over. and happens really fast. And I'll try to point it out. OK, so here they go. And he's doing this lunge. He's rearing up, snapping down at the other fly. And then the second fly gets mad. He turns around and starts hitting the other fly back. They're boxing and wrestling and hitting each other until finally at the end, one of the flies falls off the end of the territory. <laughs> and this can happen over and over again. We've watched up to five hours, and they keep um, many uh, pairs of flies will keep fighting. So <clears throat> what we can learn from watching fruit flies fight is that they have specific patterns. These can be described in words and in in video, I showed you the lunge, and I'll show you a couple other examples. Flies fence, which they poke at each other, like what it um, sounds like. They retreat, they box, they hold, and they do wing threats. And I'll show you two examples. So this top one is the slow down version of the lunge. So he's fencing, poking at him, he's going to reach down and snap up at the other fly. And this bottom one is a wing threat, where he's saying, Oh, I'm a big guy now. I'm going to put my wings up. And because flies don't have a lot of appendages, but they got those wings. So he's, he sticks it up there. And the clip is still going. It actually goes on for a minute. So he's, he's very, very adamant about his posture. And I just want to show, so this is the, the cameras we use capture the lunge in a 30th of a second. And it's still too fast, too blurry. And so I want to show you this high speed video from um, Susan. Suzanne Hoyer and Martin Heisenberg's lab in Germany. And I just want to show you how. So we're going to go frame by frame. And you're going to see that the fly comes up. He's going to extend fully, kind of use his wings in a tripod, and then snap down on the other fly. And in this clip, he actually is holding on to him, onto his wings. And the other fly is trying to get away. He's pushing, pushing, pushing. And finally, he gets away. So what happens very fast to our eyes that we can't see actually has a lot of motor patterns and complexity involved in that aggressive pattern. Females also fight, which is true in many species. Um, <laughs> But they fight uh, using different ag aggressive patterns. So females do not lunge. They do not do wing threats. They'll do a wing flick. They don't lunge. They do a headbutt. And I'll show you here. So this is a slow down movie. And the two females are sharing this little bit of yeast paste. They love yeast, as anybody that has open beer would know. But they were, they're gonna sh you're going to see their mouth parts come down. And then this female on the right is going to whack the other female with her head. So they're eating, boom. And that's why it's called a headbutt, because <laughs> they're really. <clears throat> so I showed you those movies to say that there are similar patterns that males and females have. They both fence, they both retreat. But there are specific patterns that are only found in males and females. And then another difference between male and female fights. And that is that 
males form dominant hierarchies and females don't. So just like if you had two boxers in a ring, the flies come together, they fight, and then they break apart. So we call these encounters. And if a fly has control of the territory, we say that they win that encounter. So when two males are together, one male will start winning the encounters and having control of the territory. And you can see this would be male A in blue here. And once he starts winning, he never loses. And male B, he never wins from the start. He's never in control of the territory. And so we say that this becomes the dominant male, and this becomes the subordinate or loser male. In contrast, females, you can see that the uh, blue female A will have control of the territory for one encounter, and then female B will be for three, and then goes back to female A, and then female B. And at the end of the time, the females will both be on the food cup together. So another way you could look at it is that females share, males don't. <laughs> Shocking, I know. <laughs> but the real point to these experiments is how we set up the aggression assay. And how we do that is we, we take, it's really hard to see, it's a speck. The flies are small. So we, we take the pupae from the food vial or bottle that we keep it in. We gently take it off with a forceps or, or a paintbrush, and we put them in these isolation vials. It has a bit of fly food on the bottom and cotton on the top so that the fly can breathe. And the flies are all by, the, a single fly is all by himself here or her. And they eat clothes, and then we age them for three to five days, and we put a dab of paint on their back so we can identify which one is which. And then at the uh, right age, we blow or aspirate two flies together into this fight chamber. And this is what it looks like through this hole. And then we set up the camera, and we record the fight, and that's what you saw. But the key is that these flies don't have any social experience. And within a few minutes after entering this fight chamber, especially the males, you will find them on the food territory here fighting with the patterns that I showed you. So they, nobody taught them how to do it. They didn't learn from their parents. They were hatched or eclosed. They were put together, and they knew immediately what to do. So we can say that behavior is hardwired or programmed. The genetic information, the flies are already wired to produce the aggressive behavior without any um, parental, which flies don't have, but any training. Um, so it's hardwired into the nervous system. And I also showed you that male and female flies fight differently. So because it's hardwired, we can ask, can we find a gene that controls this behavior? And this is work done in Ed Kravitz's lab by Steven Nielsen and uh, in collaboration with LF3 Avrantu, who came over to Harvard from Barry Dixon's lab from Vienna. And they asked the question, they wanted to look at a specific gene called fruitless. And this gene is necessary for male courtship behavior. So if males don't have this, this, this gene, this actually comes in two flavors, but the, the male flavor of this gene, if they don't have it, they sing a bad song, and females don't want to mate with them. And so it's called fruitless because they can try, but she's, they're not going to have any offspring. So <clears throat> they thought, well, because this is important for male courtship social behavior, let's see if this gene is important for male aggressive behavior. And so just to show you, this is the, obviously a cutoff fly head, and the brain is in blue here. So we rip open the fly's head, and then um, they're asleep, so hopefully they're <laughs> OK. And, and then we can visualize these neurons. This is a green fluorescent protein, so it glows uh, under the right conditions. And fruitless is expressed in these green neurons. And it's only it's 2,000 neurons, so it's actually a lot, but it's really only 2% of the total nervous system. So it's, it's a manageable number. And so they, they simply ask the question, is fruitless is the male form of fruitless necessary for male aggressive behavior? What they found, <clears throat> the short answer is yes. And they did some really cool, uh, clever experiments where they took, so I, I showed you that a female now uh, does the headbutting behavior, <clears throat> and males 
do the lunge behavior. But L3 and Steven made, took this female and they left all of her body parts fine. She looks like a female, she smells like a female, but they changed her central nervous system, which is this purple part down here diagram. So the brain and the ventral nerve cord, which is like our spinal cord. And so they added the male form of fruitless to this, the central nervous system of the female. So in essence, she has a female body and a male nervous system. And now she lunges. They did the same thing with males. They took the, the males outside physically looks like a male. They removed the fruitless um, product from the male CNS, making it essentially a female CNS. And now he will head headbutt. And I'll just show you what that looks like. Um, these are two females, and it goes fast, but you'll see that you'll recognize the lunge even from here. So, so boom, boom. So that female, not only did she lunge, but she drove the other female off the food cup, and now she is the dominant female. So not only did she get the, lunch, the male behavior patterns, but she got all the male behavior as well. And then we also didn't know, this was a mu much discussion in the lab, we didn't know if females would box because they have a large abdomen uh, for reproductive organs, so we thought maybe they didn't box because they can't get up there. But in this clip, um, we have a female with a male central nervous system, and then we have a feminized male here. And she's gonna, sh this is just part, an isolated part of the fight but she's gonna get up and you're gonna see her uh, pretend to or box, but the, uh, the poor f um, feminized male with the female brain doesn't know what to do and he ignores her. <laughs> so there she goes, it was really quick and he just turns away because he doesn't know, he didn't, doesn't know what that means. So to answer the question, can we find a gene that controls behavior? It's yes, in this case it's fruitless is necessary for the repeatable actions, patterns of activity we see in aggression. And the second aspect that we can learn from this is that behavior can be moved as a unit. If the lunge didn't get moved into the female piecemeal, it got now the female, you put one gene in and now she has this behavioral unit. This whole pattern came together. So genes are necessary to get the brain wired for behavior, fruitless uh, comes on er, much earlier in development, but the neurotransmitters and what Rich was talking about last, last week are really required for the output of behavior. So he showed this slide last week about the different um, neurotransmitters and, the, and what they look like. And when I was in Ed's lab, I started a project to look at the norepinephrine, which in flies it's called octopamine because in um, invertebrates it was first identified in, in the octopus. And so there are about 50,000 norepinephrine neurons in, in us, uh, quite a large number, but there's only around 100 in flies. So we could do many things to these octopamine neurons, which are now ex expressing this green fluorescent protein here in this fly brain. And when the fly is born, I can either have all the green neurons removed, just killing them, or I can stop the neurons from talking to each other. So the, you know, how the chemicals got released in the synapse that Rich talked about, we can, we can stop that process so the neurons are, are still there. There's not holes in the brains, but now they can't talk to each other. And we can also do the, the opposite in that we can make all the neurons talk to each other too much. So they're just flooding the synapse with too much chemical signals. And we can ask if we change the function of these neurons, what happens to behavior? And so when we do that, myself and Yi Rao's lab showed that these neurons, there's about 30 in this box down here, are important for aggression and for mediating the courtship aggression uh, decision, which I'll talk about briefly in the third part. And then work from Amina Segal's lab showed that these neurons are important for waking flies up from sleep. So if these octopamine neurons aren't functioning, flies sleep too much. And so what we'd like to 
to contribute to the um, community is that we'd like to be able to say, look, if you remove the function of all these 100 Drosophila octopamine neurons, you're going to get a wide variety of behavioral changes, just like if you were to mess with 50,000 neurons in our brains. But if we can know, we can realize that these 100 neurons aren't, are, are all different. They do different things. These 16 are important for sleep. These are important for aggression. Then we can identify the unique circuits and the unique attributes of each of these subpopulations. And we hope to be able to contribute, as we talked about last week, to therapeutic considerations. Because if you're targeting all the neurons, you're going to get side effects that you don't want. So if we want to, in the future, try to, to apply this to higher organisms, that, because norepinephrine is important for, for our sleep and for vertebrate sleep, we don't want to mess with aggression-promoting neurons as well. So if we can try to identify specifics of these um, subpopulations, um, we feel that this will be applicable to other systems. And also, it's no surprise that aggression, the question of aggression itself is important. It's manifested in many different disease states. This is a very small list. Um, patients with schizophrenia, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, there's a verbal and physical component to patients with Alzheimer's of aggression, to patients with Alzheimer's disease, and then um, non-intuitively depression as well. And then um, unchecked aggression, um, which may be a separate category of violence, has huge repercussions all over the world in terms of um, lives lost and economic cost as well. So we'd like to contribute to that, to that um, field of study. So that was the, the, the main part of the behavior story. And now I'm going to tell you a smaller story that behavior actually, I told you that it's hardwired, but it also can be modified. And well, the question is, what happens when a fly loses a fight? So this work was done by Al Yurkovich and others uh, took, uh, in Ed's lab at, when I was there and then uh, following. And they asked a simple question. Um, and they used male flies because males make, uh, have a winner or a loser. And so they asked, do male flies remember if they previously won or lost a fight? And so what Ali did was she put, um, she lined up a bunch of fight chambers and put flies in them. And then she fought them for 90 minutes until they established a winner or loser. So she, she was an undergrad. We give these kind of projects to undergrads. So <laughs> she had to sit in a hot, humid, dark behavior room and watch them because if they, um, there wasn't a, dom a winner or loser, then she didn't use that fight. But if there was, then she, um, <laughs> she sucked out the flies because you can't knock them out either. And she returned each to their own isolation tube, their home tube, where they sat for 30 minutes. And then she, she uh, repaired the flies in a number of different ways. So she could repair the, uh, the flies that had just fought, the winner and the loser. She could take a winner from fight chamber number two and um, pair it with the loser from fight chamber number one. She, she also took flies that hadn't fought before and um, paired them with a fly that had pr just lost a fight. And then she took two winners and two loser flies and paired them together. Any ideas what happens? <laughs> All right. Well, in a repairing, the loser loses again. But he. He doesn't lunge. In fact, there's very few encounters. They may mean at the food cup, um, may do a wing flick or a few fencing, and then the loser fly goes off into the corner and never returns. Against an unfamiliar winner, though, that um, the loser fly, he still loses, but he actually may engage in some lunge behavior, and there uh, is more likely to be more encounters on the territory than there would be in a familiar winner. So somehow, the fly, even though to me they all look the same, this fly loser recognize, recognizes a fly that he just fought against and lost, again, um, which was different than a, a winner that he'd never seen before. 
And likewise, a fly that had no fighting experience against a loser fly, that loser would lose again. In this case, it's more like the second, where he will lunge and he will have some encounters, but he will still lose again. And if, if she paired two losers together, there, there's not much fighting. <laughs> So this says, I should say, so this says two things. So it says, yes, they remember they lost, and yes, they can change their behavior. Because in this case, they're, they're literally, they, it, you, if I had two clips, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to know what happened to the first fight. You, would, you could tell that this loser is not interested in fighting with the winner that he just lost to 30 minutes ago. But it's different against these. So they can change their behavior based on their experience. And they seem to get what's called in the field a uh, loser mentality. And people do these studies not only in flies. They do it in hamsters, they do it in crustaceans, they do it in mice. And what happens when um, other organisms repeatedly lose uh, fights or encounters is that you, you can't tell like this cartoon. You can't talk to them. But there are other manifestations of losing a fight, and that is that often they'll have weight loss because they don't eat as much. Um, they're not interested in mating. The mice will just hide in the corner in the presence of a female in some cases. And their immune response is compromised. Uh, you can challenge a mice, a mouse, or a hamster with um, different bacteria, and the, and the f losers that have lost will succumb to that infection more often than winter uh, or naive animals. And so we wanted to ask the question, so obviously, this makes a difference. So does, how does it change the genes in the fly's brain? And so we wanted to look at all the 13,000 genes. I wanted to ask in, this, in a microarray analysis, this is just a picture of what, what it would look like on a chip. If a fly loses a fight, which genes get turned up and which genes get turned down? And so um, I was involved in this study, and um, less so than some of the undergrads, but we took um, we actually did like over 500 fights, and we took, we fought them for two two hours, and we took winners, losers, and control groups over 200 heads, and we um, shipped them off to Ronnie Lehmann's in Heinrich Reichardt's lab in Basel, Switzerland. And I tell you, when that FedEx man came with that package, we said, "Please be careful," because <laughs> there was a lot of personnel hours to get this. But unfortunately, there was not a lot of gene changes in the losers versus winners. And uh, I brought two, um, in collaboration with Ed, I, we're looking at two of them here at the university, um, that change in environmental conditions. But we think, and we're going to follow up with that in my lab here, but we think there's, there's two reasons for that. First is that in the two hour time window, there wasn't enough period for the flies, for the gene gene expression to change. It's not very long for our genes to get turned on and turn off. So we're going to look at proteins instead using a, a new method called eye track. But there's another reason we think that this, the first experiment, although labor intensive, didn't work very well. And that is we think there's two groups of losers. And you've seen this picture before, but if we took four males that are all siblings, okay. So they're, they're, they, they're picked on the same day. They're, uh, everything about them is genetically identical. They have the same parents. They're the same age. As far as we can tell, they're the same weight and body mass. We put them together. In one of the fights, the winner flies will lunge five times, and then the loser fly will go away and never come back. But in the next fight chamber, the winner fly and this happened to one of my undergrads studying, uh, counting the lunges. He could, this fly, winter fly actually took 302 lunges to keep the loser fly from coming back. So you might say that this winner is more aggressive, but really the loser fly is different. So this time he succumbed, lost really easy. So we think this fly might be different than this fly that kept fighting straight for two hours and took a lot of time to come back to the um, took a lot of time to eventually lose the, the food, to, to eventually lose the fight. So we're breaking down our loser groups into two different categories. 
And evolutionarily, it makes a little sense to, for the, the loser effect to last longer. Because um, the idea in the field is that if you want to have, if you want to live for another day and have the chance to pass your genes on to your to progeny, you have to remember when you weren't successful. So if you've lost a fight, it probably should stay with you rather than winning a fight. So this is my only other segue to John's talk next week about pos uh, thinking and depression. And that we know that flies are affected when they lose a fight. They have their own form of social defeat. And we want to understand the molecular adaptations that occur in resilient flies. So in other words, what is the basis of the individual differences in response to stress? And the last part I'm going to briefly talk about is um, work in my lab about trying to understand when flies uh, court or fight. So I haven't shown any videos, and, and I'm not going to hear. This is a picture of a male fly on the right and a female fly on the left. And he's starting to sing a song to her and um, try to make her receptive for mating and the aggression on the right. But these two social behavior choices offer an important choice point for the, for the male fly, because males do courtship. The male fly has to use the same sort of environmental stimuli or vi environmental information, whether it's visual through the, his eyes, whether it's um, olfactory smelling, whether it's, there's a hearing component, auditory, or taste. Use all that environmental information when a second fly comes into its territory and say, oh, that's a female. I better proceed with courtship. Or if it's a male, I better make the right decision and proceed with aggression. So how, how do male flies do this? So if, you, if we were to map out what a circuit like that for behavior would look like in the brain, we have to take into all these components. The environmental cues I just talked about, they have to get integrated somewhere in the fly brain, and then they have to drive the right motor output. When I came here, I knew that octopamine neurons, which I've talked about before, were important in this choice point. And here are, there's three actually, and here are two beautiful um, octopamine neurons in the fly brain that are important for this choice point. And when the function of these are disrupted, we see a really interesting phenotype in that the behavior of the male fly is mixed. So if I were to show you a clip of the fight chamber and two males, so only fighting should be seen. The male fly will lunge at the second fly, and then he'll walk over a little bit farther, and then he'll try to court him. He'll sing him, try to get him receptive, and then he'll walk a little farther, and he'll uh, do another lunge, all in like 15 seconds. So the behavior of this male fly is, is really mixed up. But what we think happens is that the male, he, the octopamine neurons are not in this first stage here. They, they don't aren't involved in the input. So I think they're involved in the integration and that the male can't respond to the situation appropriately. He's getting the cues, but he doesn't know reliably what to do with them. And so we have a nice middle part. And in work I don't have time to tell you that, that we've done here this year, we have the beginning part. So we have a really cool connection between the taste receptor neurons, some specific taste neurons and the octopamine neurons. But to see this, we, um, to find the next step in this, to the circuit, we're looking at the individual morphology or anatomy of neurons. And John, this is the, the part. So um, we can take a, make a 3D reconstruction of the fly brain and look at the branching patterns of the different green neurons. In these cases, this is um, dopamine. But what I want to show from this 3D reconstruction, first of all, I think it's really beautiful. But secondly, that the, these axons project to many parts of the brain. And if you want to know who this axon, for example, is talk, this neuron, for example, is talking to you, it's too complicated. You can't, it's 
too hard to, to tell. But instead of just labeling all the neurons, like I've shown you, we can also use a genetic trick to label just one neuron. So this is one octopamine neuron that's involved in the decision-making process. And the cell body is down here. And what I hope you can appreciate is that this one neuron sends branches throughout a good portion of the middle part of the fly brain. And it's very complex. But because we know the pattern of this fly brain, then we can say, oh, we have an idea of what, where the neurons are that, are he's, he, that this neuron is talking to. So morphology can tell us, this descriptive part of the morphology can tell a lot, us a lot about function. And to get to the next step, we're using a system called GRASP. And I, in that picture, the, the brain is black. Right? But it's really complex. It's like this picture of a crowd. So if you want to know who this guy up here with his arms are talking to, it's not devoid of it. It's just a very complicated mixture of neurons, glia, extracellular stuff. And so to figure out who he's talking to, we're using this grasp, grasp system. And in this grasp system, there's half of this green fluorescent protein on one tied to one synapse, which is here in gray. And the other half of the, uh, or a little part, of the GFP protein on a second synapse over here. And in the pictures I'll show you, this is the octopamine neuron. And it's only when these synapses come in close proximity to each other is, are, are the two halves of the protein able to come together, and we can see green fluorescent protein. So to figure out who is talking to who, we need to look for green in this system. And when we do that, this is um, the, the fly brain. And you can see that it's mostly black, uh, blank. Or actually, it's blue. But um, down here is some green and a higher magnification. You can see it here. here. And what this tells us is that, uh, and I've, I've left out we can label these, but it becomes quite, quite messy. But this neuron coming in and this neuron coming in join here. And these are the areas of membrane or hopefully synaptic contact between two neurons in this decision-making circuit. OK, so why should you care about um, flies for this section? It's, it's no surprise to, to any of you that social behavior is important. As parents, we try to watch our kids navigate and learn this process of how to get along with peers and authority figures. And day to day, we do the same thing at work, at home, in our social groups. So it's important for anybody to be able to interpret the signals that they receive and to act appropriately on them. And we think even though courtship in flies is maybe it seems far removed, that the the fly still has to make the de um, decisions in an analogous manner that, that we would. And also, I tried to show throughout the talk that even though we can label, we can give neurons a label based on what, they, uh, what neurotransmitter or what gene they're ex uh, expressing, there's a lot of diversity within the subpopulation. And these are three octopamine neurons, their cell bodies are down here. So if you just looked at their cell bodies, you'd say, oh, they probably did the same thing. They're all together right in that region. But when you actually look at their individual morphology, which is color coded, you can see that they go to completely different parts of the fly brain. And I'm sure they're involved in completely different circuits and completely different networks and maybe completely different behaviors, even though they look like they should be the same. So there's a lot of diversity between the neurons. Sex um, specific, probably, and uh, location-wise, even within a subpopulation. I think that will be very important to consider as we tackle different um, neurodegenerative and uh, um, psych uh, psychiatric type models, as we talked about last week. And to conclude, um, I've tried to discuss with you tonight that all our capabilities emerge only when our networks or ensembles ensembles of neurons work together. And that the goal of any neuroscientist and, and uh, people interested in the brain is to understand how it, it's orchestrated for life. And thank you for attention.
and I'll answer any questions. For the fighting behavior to be useful, you, it w you would think you would have to select the stronger males to, to be the victors. And that you seem to attribute it to be a, the losers had a mental problem as, as opposed to a strength problem. How do you, how do you tell the, between the two? Yeah, <clears throat> so the, well, um, by, by virtue of the fact that when they're, so there's a couple things. We really try hard to control for, for that, um, for that in terms of body size, but also because of the behavior of the loser who actually can um, lunge and fight in the, the second, the other pairings. And losers, if they're paired together, a loser can, there, there will sometimes be a winner in those pairings. So it's not that they can't fight, it's not that they're um, not physically able to do that. When they're repaired, they can. So it argues against that there, there, there is some, obviously there's some difference between the winner and the loser flies. But we don't think it's to do to, to just pure strength. Are there any studies that, um, like with autistic uh, people, where maybe they're missing the two parts of that green protein that don't come together? Oh, well, the, the green protein is just um, <laughs> I know it's green. Because <laughs> well, it comes from jellyfish, and we just use it as a marker. marker. So it's really not, that's why we can right. use it in flies and many other, because flies and mice and um, worms and other things that we've used, that people have used green fluorescent protein for, don't have that like the jellyfish does. So we just use it as an anatomical marker to study the, the neurons. But are they maybe missing the proteins that come together to make decisions um, and get feedback? There are, there are a lot of studies trying to understand autistic, autism spectrum disorders. And there is um, there's huge, actually really huge consortiums to try to find um, individual genes that are, are responsible for, for the deficits. And it's been really hard to, to do that, which, I mean, even among groups of tens of thousands of people uh, getting together around the world to look at kids, be because autism spectrum disorders ha ha appear to have a lot of genes that could go, that could go wrong. So it's not just one single gene or even five. It might be 50 or more that can go wrong. And it wouldn't have to be a complete loss of fun it, the gene not being there or not functioning. It could just not be functioning not as well. And so those types of mutations are harder to pick up. And they're not, there's not huge family studies like there would be for something like Huntington's disease or something where you have um, a family that has the same diagnosis, the same phenot same problems, and then you can look at their genetics. But autism spectrum, spectrum disorder has the word spectrum for a reason. It's so broad that it's a harder to pinpoint. Mm -hmm. What happened when the two winners? Yeah. Did they just like destroy each other because they didn't know how to lose? No, actually. So, I mean, that's why I put the losers up. It's much more clear with the losers. The winners uh, are really mixed. They don't really remember that much that they won. I mean, they will win against the loser flies, but that actually might be because the partially because the loser fly is more subordinate than than the winner fly. So the two winners. Um, it's it's a mix. It's it's really a mixed bag. Somebody could lose. There could be a draw, or they could just it, um, not really fight. How do you, how do you? I believe that I understood that you actually move fruitless genes from one brain or one individual fruit fly to another. Yeah. Um, yes. All right. How do you do that? Do you use little tiny tweezers, or or what? What's the what's the magic? Yeah, um, it's 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 done genetically. So, the um, the the gene that encodes the male form of fruitless. So, like I said, fruitless comes in several different flavors. 
All right, and that's because of what's called alternative splicing. So from the same gene, you can get different products based on how the gene is put together. So there, if there's boxes that say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the male form might have 1, 3, 5, 7, and the female 1, 3, 7. And then, so you can, it, you can get different forms of this in males or females. And so what we can do in flies is we can, it's, it's called a transgene. We can put the male form of the gene into the female DNA and then every cell in her body will, ha will express that male form. I'm sorry, not every cell. Every cell in her nervous system will express that male form of fruitless. Does that make sense? And then vice versa, we can use, um, in the males, we take it away by, it's called RNAi interference. And that just means that when the, the male form of fruitless, that transcript is made, then we can chop it up and so that there's never a protein. And this is all done genetically. We don't touch the flies. That, that's the beauty, that every fly that comes out of this vial is the same. And so we can really test um, individuals because they're not individuals, they're genetically the same. So we can put a gene in with this transgene. We can remove a gene, the gene product with an RNAi. We're, we're not removing the gene, it's still there. But when the product comes off the DNA as an RNA, it, we chew it up, and um, then it, it, do, it doesn't work. Is there somebody way up here? Okay. I was just wondering, after, after, the, um, after you changed the chemistry in the females especially, did any of those, did they ever mate? Um, Reproduce? Let's see, I'm trying to remember. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if they ever, I'm trying to remember if that experiment was ever done. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think they would not because they would reject the male even though they look like a female. I think it would depend on how persistent the, the male was, but the female should reject the male because she's, she's got the male um, nervous system which would do that. I don't. I don't know if that, I cannot remember if the experiment was done, but I, that, that would be my prediction, that she wouldn't. Very nice presentation of obviously some very sophisticated research. Thank you. When you did your repairing experiments, you had them in isolation for 30 minutes. Did you ever try a longer period of isolation to see how long that learned behavior might last? Yeah. So Ali did the first ones, and then uh, subsequent Jill Penn has tried that in Ed's lab, and flies only live a little bit over 50 days, so they don't have a great long-term memory. So you, <laughs> um, so sh she would do, if, if, she, if the loser lost twice in a row, he would maintain that memory for at least another day. But it's also, phys it's also labor intensive to do those experiments, but they don't have a really long-term memory. So if it fought once and then you did it 36 hours later, it won't remember. So not only can behavior be modified, but it can be reversed as well. Thank you. Do consistent losers have shorter lives? Um, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. And um, again, it kind of depends on the... Um, how much punishment your undergrad or graduate student is willing to take. <laughs> and, because, um, and also there's an element, I, I can't, I didn't have enough pictures here, but you, you, you cannot, usually we um, knock them out, put them to sleep to paint them and to, min, to manipulate them, but you cannot knock flies out with carbon dioxide because they lose, they lose their memory then. So you really have to go in and we have, we call them fly aspirators or fly suckers and you have to suck the flies out of the chamber and put them back in their tubes. So you have to have an undergrad that's willing to watch, suck them out, repeat, and there's also escapers and so they end up have, it's probably swearing a lot in the behavior room. But um, the short answer is we don't have enough, Ed's lab or myself lab doesn't have enough numbers to answer that question. Thank you.
Sarah, when, when you look at the changes that are taking place and the plasticity, and then you're looking at the morphology of the connection, do you think you'll see changes in connections or something more subtle than that and just the signaling that goes on at those connections? Yeah, we would, okay, um, the question is, considering that we can see the, a lot of detail in the anatomy of individual neurons, if we fought a fly for five fights they lost, and then we looked at that, the morphology or anatomy of that neuron, Rich is asking if I, would, if I would predict that there would be changes that we could see, or if it's all more activity based. When I came interviewed here, that was one of my future research uh, projects, and because I would re we would really like to know the answer to that question. Is, is there flight scale MRI on the way? Um, <laughs> we can do. I actually I took that fly, that slide out, but we can do. It's called volumetric analysis, and it's really amazing. We can we can get down to like that. We can we can say using this analysis that that this. Branching makes you know we can we can show how much the volume of this side of the branches are compared to the hundred percent of the neuron. So we can say like this is forty four percent of the ner of the neuron. So we can get a lot of detail. So I think we could answer that question given the le e the level of resolution that we have with these um, with this volumetric analysis and this green fluorescent protein that we use. It just takes a lot of hands to be able to. Fu to fight flies consecutively five times in a row and ask that question. You mentioned four conditions, schizophrenia, ADD, Alzheimer's, and depression. How, and you talked about therapeutic benefits. How do you relate you know, the information that you shared with us tonight and apply it to treating those conditions? OK. So I'm, when I said that, and I, and I did mean it, I'm not trying to say that everything that what I showed you tonight is directly applicable to humans. But what I am trying to say is that, especially with the picture of the ectopamine neurons that I drew the boxes around, that if you can say that this subgroup of neurons that produce this neurotransmitter, whether it's um, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, are involved in this circuit, and this circuit has this properties. So maybe you can't target serotonin or octopamine, but you could target other properties or molecules that this circuit has. And we're worried about an easy one is sleep. So if we're worried about the circuit that, that if we're studying sleeplessness or the failure to wake up for not death, but the fa not sleeping right, then we can target those individual circuits and leave the other circuits alone. And that's where I think the work is going. In humans, we have 50,000 norepinephrine neurons. So they're involved in lots of processes. So let's take the capabilities of the 100 neurons in flies, and let's explore those in vertebrates, and then using that information, hopefully go higher. So I don't think there's any direct therapeutic approaches, but enough to say that, look, these are the capabilities of this group of neurons there's a lot of diversity of capabilities. Let's try to pinpoint the capabilities for the sub, um, subpopulations of neurons and use that information in different organisms. I have another question. You know, certain, can, you know, certain people have problems with aggression. And I know someone who's had a brain injury can sometimes you know, have aggressive behaviors, or maybe there are other conditions. So is this research useful in finding ways to control or evaluate you know, that, those types of aggressions? Yeah, I mean, we really hope so. We, again, not directly. But we hope that we, if we understand the normal pathways or networks or circuits that control aggression, that we can understand what happens to those circuits in disease states or in injured states or in uh, trauma states as well. So yes, not directly. Well, just a comment. I am reminded of Richard Bridges' comment last week uh, that I think is so very important. And that is the value of basic research uh, and the importance of looking at some of these fundamental questions in various systems 
not necessarily knowing where they might lead, but coming after them in a way that really values the importance of the basic fundamental questions that are being asked. And I think we see, have seen that throughout this series so far. I would second that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did you say that when you genetically alter a, the gene, a, you know, and you're working on that fruitless thing, <laughs> did, you, did you say you don't touch the flies? No. Okay. Yeah. How, how do you do that then? I mean, it's not like you can just go zap in there. Um, uh, boy. Yes, <laughs> I mean, well, um, literally, so we make different stocks or lines of flies that, ex that express these, these trans genes. And they're, they're literally just chunks of DNA that we used to do this in the lab, but we send them now to companies. And the companies inject them into the fly um, embryo, the baby fly, and then it gets incorporated, incorporated into their chromosome. Okay, so there's an extra piece of DNA inside the chromosome, and that piece of DNA has the transgene. So it, in, the, in the fruitless case, it has the male form of fruitless for the female. And in the male case, it has the, um, the ability to knock out the male form of fruitless. So it's sitting there in their for example, on their second chromosome, and it gets turned on at the right, we turn it on at the right time. Well, it gets turned on at the right time. I don't, we don't touch it. And then, um, and then every cell that we want it to, so every neuron will turn that male form of fruitless on based on the gene that's sitting in the chromosome. So this will happen in the one female, in her sister, in her next sister, in her next sister, because flies can have lots of progeny. So, it's because that we can add a piece of DNA back to the chromosome and just have it sit there and do its job. This is true in flies and, and true in so many other model organisms, mice, worms, everything. So you're right, we don't touch it. We have them made. We construct a piece of, we add genes that we want to by, by making constructs, we call them, and inserting them into the chromosomes and then they do their stuff. Right. May I just ask some questions, Sarah? Mm -hmm. I notice that you keep saying we, we, we. Uh, and I think that's sort of exciting. Um, can you just tell us, I mean, maybe everybody else knows this, but how does your lab work here at the University of Montana? Who's involved in it and sort of how does it get its stuff done? Um, well, through the grant money that I got to start my lab here at the university, which comes from NIH and the university, I'm able to employ two uh, full-time research technicians. And so they work 40 hours doing the experiments, um, making fly food, that's a small part, and doing the experiments, dissecting brains, doing the behavior. I also have um, two undergrads working with me for credit, research for credit, and so they're learning how uh, lab works, and then they're contributing to these projects because well, I said we give labor intensive, but they're all the projects that that I give the um, undergrads are important. So that's the composition of my lab right now. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And we'll see you next week.